Muslims during the golden age of Islam between the 7th and the 17th centuries AD traveled throughout the planet and had a profound impact upon human relations. And when the Portuguese had finally overcome the Muslims in Al-Andalus, in 1492 we find the last stronghold, Granada, falling. They inherited uh, a technology that was a, a combination of the technologies of China and India uh, and ancient Europe and Africa and the world. And it is reported that one of the conquerors known as an explorer, Vasco da Gama, he rounded the Cape of Good Hope uh, in the 15th century and he was seeking a way around southern Africa. It was not surprising uh, that he was able to do this because his boat was designed by Muslims and he carried an astrolabe with him and other devices and Morescos were on his boat and he hired a navigator, Ahmed bin Majid. And so he found his way around with Islamic help and reached into the Indian Ocean. And the Arab seafarers were familiar with the Indian Ocean from earliest times. Now historians and geographers are real, realizing that not only did they uh, travel the East African coastline, but they went deep into the south. What is reported is that they actually went around the southern part of Africa and they made it into the Cape of Good Hope long before European presence. The first recorded presence uh, of Muslims uh, in the Cape where we actually have written records is coming in in the Western Cape around the 1650s and uh, in what is now known as Cape Town the Dutch established a colony on the coastline. In this colony they brought slaves and political prisoners from India, from Indonesia, from New Guinea from Malaysia, from Madagascar, and from East and West Africa. And this base of operations um, that the uh, Dutch had developed, um, you could say, or is now known as the mother city of South Africa. And within the Cape itself, there were a number of uh, early Islamic personalities. In these personalities, there was Tuan Matadin, who was a prisoner on Robben Island. There was also uh, Tuan Rahman and Tuan Mahmud who came from Sumatra in Indonesia. In 1667, they were able to establish a community uh, in an area of Cape Town that is known as Constantia. And by 1694, and especially in April 2nd of 1694, a special personality comes into the Cape region. That is Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar. He arrived as a political prisoner. And he was known to be a very important person within Indonesia and all of the Malaysian lands. He came in with his family and 49 followers. He was related to one of the sultans of Indonesia. He had made pilgrimage to Mecca in 1644. He stayed in Mecca and he became fluent in the Arabic language. He memorized the Quran. He became proficient in uh, uh, Quranic interpretation known as tafsir. He studied the hadiths, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. He studied jurisprudence. Uh, he studied the traditional Islamic sciences and he became a very important person within the culture of the people of the Cape. He is known to have struggled uh, in Indonesia and it is through his efforts that a community starts to develop. And we find uh, uh, again a beautiful blending uh, that is happening within cultures that develops the culture of the people of the Cape. The Dutch had used their superior weapons to defeat the Indonesians. They also used division between uh, Amirs and Kings 
and greed, something similar to what happened in Andalusia. Sheikh Yusuf himself resisted colonization. And with 4,000 fighters, he resisted for a long period of time until finally he was captured and exiled to Sri Lanka. From Sri Lanka, he then uh, entered into the Cape. And so uh, he is recognized as a very important uh, personality within uh, South African Muslim culture. He is looked upon as the father uh, of the Muslims within the Cape. In his group, his colony that was set up, uh, were 12 Imams and their wives and their children. And they settled in the mouth of the Erst River and Sheikh Yusuf of Makassa, Rahimahullah, he was able to rally um, the Muslim slaves to conduct religious uh, services and he spread Islam to the indigenous Khoi Khoi people who were living in that region. He died in 1699, but he is still known today as the father of the Muslims of the Cape and as a very important figure within Islamic history in Southern Africa. He wrote books in three languages. He wrote in Malay, Boganis, and in Arabic. And his memory is uh, cherished by the people of the Cape and recognized as one of the most important individuals uh, in their history. By 1725, the Cape is now developing and um, slaves are being brought in, uh, again from Indonesia, from Madagascar, from East Africa, uh, from different parts of Sri Lanka and India. And it is reported that 3,000 convicts, uh, prisoners of war, were brought in specially to work on the harbor itself. And amongst these prisoners of war are people that they call bandit imams or exiled imams. And these imams uh, work directly with the people. And what they presented for the slaves at that time was an alternative culture. So you could say in a sense that it was a form of resistance. And that's why the authorities called them bandits. Although they were highly religious people, but they were giving an alternative to the alcohol and the adultery and the confusion that was coming within the predominant uh, Dutch culture at the time. These Imams conducted special gatherings in private homes, especially those that were owned by freed Muslims. And their resistance became powerful. And many slaves, or especially those people who were able to come out of slavery to manumit themselves and were free, entered into Islam. Another important issue uh, happening in the Cape region at the time is that um, wine becomes an important export. And um, the Muslim slaves now did not drink alcohol, but they were involved heavily in education and they preferred not to drink, so they were more sober than the non-Muslim people who were there, uh, who were working in the region. And so large numbers of people accept Islam and um, upward mobility is actually uh, developed through accepting Islam. And the Dutch authorities, although they hated the resistance in the Muslims, they wanted to have Muslims working because they weren't drunk, they were honest people, and they prayed. And that is a benefit for somebody who is controlling uh, an area and needs uh, strong, sober, sustained help. When the British abolished slavery and they freed African people in a number of their colonies, about 5,000 of these Africans came into the region between uh, 1808 and 1856. Uh, they came mainly from Mozambique and um, when they came into the region, they actually saw Islam as the best alternative for their lives. So they entered into Islam in large numbers and they bolstered the Muslim community and um, strong madrasas start to develop. So that by the year 1780, individuals are rising up, one of them known as Tuan Guru in the Malaysian language, or Imam Abdullah ibn Qadi Abdus Salam. He uh, uh, comes out, he emerges as the strongest personality at that time. 
he was banished to Robben Island, the same place where President Nelson Mandela uh, suffered during the apartheid uh, regime. Uh, Tuan Guru was banished to Robben Island, and um, finally, when he came out in 1793, he wrote the Quran, the whole Quran, from his memory. And this text is still found today in the uh, first mosque uh, that was established in Cape Town. And um, this masjid that was established around 1834 is known as Awal Mosque. And so it is the first mosque to be established uh, in the Cape. The Imam, of course, coming out of the tradition of Tuan Guru, uh, and right in line with these teachings helps the people to come into Islam. So what happens is that Tuan Guru and the others who follow him then convert many people not by force, not by violence, but people come into Islam through education. People see Islam as a means of raising their status in life, as a means of understanding what is happening in the world. And it is reported that those who were still in ball and chain slavery, those who, who could not move around in the evening because of the chains, would get up in the middle of the night and pray to Hajjid prayer with chains. They would get up in the middle of the night and read the Quran in chains. This is a powerful part of the history of Muslims living in the Cape. And this is part of the important uh, understanding which is now arising uh, out of the Cape region that shows the connection between Muslims in Southern Africa with Muslims living in East Africa, Madagascar, Malaysia, Indonesia. And we find from the writings and the teachings of the scholars that the Muslims in South Africa in the early period were also connected with uh, the Muslims in Arabia. Their leaders had studied in Mecca. The teachings were coming from traditional uh, Islamic uh, sciences. And the culture that develops becomes connected directly to the Muslim world. The Muslims in Southern Africa uh, living at the Cape uh, developed a, a beautiful culture, which was another blending of Islamic cultures and the indigenous languages and understandings of the region. And this is in line with what happened with the Swahilis, who developed a, a culture based upon Arab merchants who were coming into East Africa and intermarrying with the indigenous people of East Africa. In this case, we have um, uh, slaves and political prisoners who are coming from the East, coming from Indonesia and Malaysia, from Sri Lanka, from Madagascar, from East Africa, and even from West Africa, all coming into the Cape, and they are being controlled by the Dutch. They are also living within South Africa, and the leading uh, or the major indigenous group are the Khoi Khoi uh, people. And um, so their language, the indigenous language, now mixes um, with Malaysian languages and then mixes with the Dutch language. And from out of this comes a, a new language. And um, this Dutch-based language is called Afrikaans. And so um, basically what it is is a Creole form of uh, a Dutch, but there is so much influence from Malaysian uh, languages uh, and, and some touches of Khoi Khoi also that um, it takes on a new form. And what is interesting about Afrikaans is that um, it is expressed by the people uh, in a local way and also it is written in the Arabic script. So what we are finding is that um, in the same way that in uh, Al-Andalus, that Spanish was written in Arabic script, also in West Africa, we find that Mandinka languages, the Songhai language, the Fulani language, Wolof, the languages of the Tawarek are also written in the Arabic language. We find that Persian is expressed through the Arabic language. Turkish is expressed through the Arabic language. So we find that Arabic becomes a lingua franca. 
It becomes a language of education, a language of culture, a language of even transmitting uh, non-Arabic expressions. This is a powerful testimony to this language. And at that point in history, Arabic was still dominating much of the world. Muslims were the first to write Afrikaans in Arabic script. And so um, the early expressions of Afrikaans are coming out within Islamic texts. So we find, for instance, books on Aqidah, on faith, books on uh, grammar of Arabic, on uh, interpretation of the Qur'an, on the traditions and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They are written in Afrikaans, but it's an Arabic script. So these textbooks actually now are considered to be um, one of the most important aspects of the written uh, heritage of Southern Africa. And it, it is now being uh, brought together in the African Union to, to make part of the rich culture of the African continent, which brought together people from different continents and different languages. And again, it is so interesting that Arabic uh, is at the basis of this. And Muslims are the agents of uh, bringing together different nationalities and also raising education to a high level within society. So this uh, young Muslim community living in the bondage of slavery then becomes liberated when slavery is abolished. But following this, a uh, terrible period of colonialism is developed in South Africa, which eventually leads into what is known as apartheid. And that is where people are separated based upon their color and based upon their nationalities. And so within the apartheid system, the white complexion people live in a separate area, they live on the high grounds and they get the best area. The middle people called the coloreds, the people who are mixed, are living in the middle regions and they usually work as artisans and they work as domestics and some semi-skilled uh, jobs. And the African people are living on the bottom and are working in the gold mines and the diamond mines and the most menial jobs within the society itself. Muslims find themselves in the middle. They find themselves not in the top dominating classes and not in the lowest, most oppressed class. But they were oppressed and put into a very strategic position. So many of the Muslims were involved in the struggle against apartheid. They used their, uh, their, their education, they used their, their, their intelligence to try to bring the oppressed people from out of a state of oppression. From the time of Tuangudu, you go back to the 18th century, and even before that, to the time of Sheikh Yusuf Maqassa, back in the 17th century, Muslims were providing upward mobility through Islam. That people who did not know how to express themselves uh, through written languages could not read uh, textbooks carrying science and literature, were introduced to writing through the Arabic language. Through the reading of the Qur'an, they were able to then go into uh, the revelation. They were able to learn the sayings of the great ulama who came out of the Middle East and out of much of Africa. And so Muslims provided this upward mobility for the oppressed people through the religion of Islam and through the learning of Arabic and the memorization of the Qur'an and the great writings of the ulama who uh, came from all parts of the Muslim world. The Cape Muslims were able to travel uh, out of South Africa. And it is reported that uh, from way back in the 18th century, some of them managed to actually reach Arabia. And they made pilgrimage to Arabia. So from the 18th century into the 19th century, they had a term they called the Muslims of the Cape Ahlul Kahf, which we would know as the people of the cave. And there's a chapter called Surat al-Kahf, uh, the chapter of the cave in the Qur'an. Maybe the Meccans considered um, the Cape Muslims to be so far away, to be like in a cave or to be in a distant place. And they called them Ahlul Kahf. And um, they came into Mecca and they uh, uh, made the pilgrimage 
and settle down in Arabia. Later on, during um, the colonial period, where Muslims were involved in uh, uh, being artisans and semi-skilled labor, they became excellent tailors. So they made excellent suits and excellent clothing to the point where the ones who were able to go to the pilgrimage to Mecca uh, and they uh, started to sew clothing for the people of Mecca, they became the tailors of the Ashraf, Ashraf <coughs> the tailors of the sultans, and they uh, lived in Mecca and they intermarried with the people uh, in that region. So they make a, a vibrant community. And what develops from the apartheid is a negative and a positive. The negative is that Muslims are separated from other people and <clears throat> they are oppressed by a, a strong racial regime. But the positive is that Muslims are forced to come together to live in collectives. And this forms a type of mini Islamic state. So within the regions, especially in Cape Town, where you come into the Muslim sections, you find the Adhan being called openly, uh, all of the shops are selling halal food, um, the women are dressing according to Islam, uh, children are playing around and, and they are mostly Muslims. And so it, it is a strange phenomena that happens. Muslims are forced together, but through coming together in a state of Islam, they are able to actually preserve their faith and to raise themselves to a higher level. So what develops out of this is that within the 20th century, Muslims then come to Cairo, they come to Medina and Mecca, and they start to uh, learn to read the Qur'an. What develops out of this is a type of Qira'ah. It is a level of the recitation of the Qur'an that becomes world class. And some of the great uh, uh, Hufaz coming out of Egypt, um, some of the greatest of the Qur'an readers would go down to the Cape and read for the people in the Cape and they would involve themselves in Qur'anic competitions and this continues up until today to the level of the people of the Cape is one that is recognized by people throughout the planet. Also the struggle, because the history of, Cape, of the Cape is one of struggle, the struggle then is, 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 is recognized not only within South Africa but without South Africa. So Muslims from the Cape also are very much involved in the issues within the Muslim world. And they have a very powerful voice. And although their number is small, uh, their voice is heard uh, throughout the world. So um, this culture of the Cape uh, is, a, is a beautiful blending. And the, the, the Cape Tonians, who are known as Malays, the terminology is using Malay, but actually it is a beautiful blending of Asian, uh, of African, of Indian, um, of Turkish, all types of blood, of European, all types of blood uh, are mixed together within the Cape Tonian community. And also different foods are found within their culture. So again, it is another beautiful blending of the cultures of the world. And, and, and that is one of the great blessings um, that Islam has uh, for the world. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was surrounded by people of all nationalities. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not submit to Arab nationalism, but taught that the best amongst the Muslims is the one who has faith. It is not based upon the color of your skin, nor is it based upon your class or your lineage. So the Muslims of the Cape continue in this tradition and they are able to build over 150 masjids within Cape Town and its vicinity itself. They are also able to export their uh, Quran readers around South Africa, around the Southern Hemisphere, and they are being benefited from in many parts of the Muslim world today. This is part of the legacy of struggle. And from the early times, uh, Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar, Tuan Guru and all those who were struggling to maintain the Arabic language, those who would get up in the middle of the night and perform tahajjud prayer, those who would read the Quran even though they were tortured to the point of death. It is through this struggle that Islam uh, continues and thrives and that Muslims are able to participate in the struggles of other people in 
other parts of the world. And so um, we again open up this gem uh, of wisdom, an untold story of Islam, an untold story of world history. I leave you with this in peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.